All right. Well, welcome everyone this morning to our Bible Life class. I want to go ahead and uh, begin with prayer and just ask the Lord to be with us as we get into his word. Can we just pray together? Lord, we thank you, God, uh, for your word, and we are just thankful, God, that you speak to us in so many ways, O oh Lord, and we just want to have an open heart and an open mind to you today, Lord, and what you want to do in our lives. And uh, we want to be receptive. Speak to us, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we are uh, going into a series on uh, loving the unloved. And <clears throat> we'll be talking about the great love that Jesus has for all people, whether they are uh, overlooked and deemed as unimportant, seen as outcasts in society, or even hated or marginalized by others. Uh, Jesus loved those that others refused to love. Uh, and today, uh, we're, we're talking about looking uh, to those that are overlooked. Looking at those that are overlooked. Uh, looking for those that are overlooked. Uh, I want to bless and I want to serve those that are overlooked. And we live in a society where uh, people are overlooked. But we could say that probably almost every society that has ever been it overlooks people. And that, that there is something in our human nature that makes us in a way where we easily overlook people for a variety of reasons. You know, we can think about a person like Joseph and the story of Joseph. And I know in recent weeks we've talked about Joseph. Um, but imagine, you know, Joseph sitting uh, on just a makeshift bench within the walls of an ancient uh, Egyptian prison. Uh, he's deep in thought and he is trying to make sense of his situation. How did he get here? How did this all happen? Uh, you, you know, you think about something like Joseph, like there's levels of that, right? Because he's gone from, uh, he's not even in his home anymore, for one. That's strange. But then he's, you know, he's thinking about how the fact that at least things got better and that he was in some kind of high position in somebody's home and it was comfortable and so much better than the prison that he's in. And no doubt, Joseph's probably not very far at this time, and, and he's in jail, but he's not probably very far from the palace of Pharaoh. Uh, very, very close, and yet uh, he's in a foreign land. People that don't probably think very much of him. Those are not his people. And not only are they not his people, but he's in jail. They don't care. Um, we would know this later because people forgot about him, right? He's interpreting dreams. People forget about him. He's, he's just there. Uh, and, and, you know, he's having flashbacks of, of what had happened, what had transpired in his life. And, and there he is. Uh, and it, it changed him. It shaped him. And he would, you know, feel helpless and go through this difficult trial there. Um, but... In that situation, what we understand and what we know is that God had a very different view of him than the people around him. He was overlooked. He was an outcast. But yet, God saw in Joseph something more. Uh, God put dreams in Joseph's life. Uh, God could see what others could not see in the life of Joseph. And we know the story and we can see how it unfolds. And a person like Joseph, we can see how that unfolds, but that unfolds because Joseph was committed and, and, and followed through with what God had purposed in his life. Uh, but God was there with Joseph. And God saw Joseph. Um, and, you know, we, it, they, they have a thing, this, this idea of, of, of segmentation or segmenting. And, and they'll do this like in things like marketing where people, they'll segment people out. Okay? And, and what they do is they want to try to group people to like they can market to certain types of people. And so it's like someone's going to sell a product and they're going to say, okay, well, who are we going to sell this to? And let's look at all the people in our community and we're going to cut it up into pieces and, you know, slice it up in different ways and say, well, what are the different types of people that we have? 
right? You know, you, you might say that, that there's, a, there's a segment that, that appeals to a single mom, maybe, or something, right? And, and you might have a segment that group, maybe it's a larger one that just appeals to parents, and they start to di- divide it up into smaller. What kind of types of parents are there, right? Um, and, and so they'll do this, and even to the day, today, they'll do this thing where it's called a segment of one, where we can see this when you're on any kind of social media, you're on apps on your phone, or you're, you're, you're online, or whatever, and they track you, if you didn't know that they're tracking you, you know, basically, uh, the, you know, it's, who knows who's tracking you, but everybody's tracking you, probably, but, you know, they're all following you, and what they do is you get these ads that are very, very specific to you, and then they call that a segment of one, because they're, like, they're identifying your unique person, you know, and, and so they'll try to appeal directly to you. Uh, and so you'll see aver- uh, companies that will put out like you know ten different advertisements, but the, all those advertisements maybe appeal to this group and then this group. And if you ever see an advertisement that doesn't appeal to you, it's probably because it's not supposed to appeal to you. It's appealing to somebody else. Um, and so, but when we look at that, what, when I when I think of that concept, I think of like you know we 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 can all be grouped in different kinds of ways, right? And and we we then not only can we be grouped in different kinds of ways. But we get really highly uh, specialized in living life, right? Adulting, right? We're doing our, we're, we're living life good, and we're we're trying to be really good at life, and we get really good at it. And and what we end up doing is we kind of we can sometimes kind of put ourselves in some kind of category, and then what we do is we only relate with people that are in that same kind of category as us. And, and so we're not open to new experiences. We're not open-minded in certain kinds of ways. And I think that gets a negative stigma. People are like, oh, you're open-minded. That means you're just going to do whatever you want, it's sinful or whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. People are closed-minded. They don't want to be open to any kind of new experiences at all in their life, and even, even to the extent that they don't want to, like, interact with somebody that's a little bit different than them. Right? And, and, and we see this in society all the time. We can't relate with each other. And why, why can't we? Because we can't, we can't somehow in our flesh, in our, in our sinful nature, prohibits us in certain ways because of maybe it's pride or our selfishness or something. We, we don't allow ourselves to see beyond our own ways of viewing the world, beyond our own routines. And, and so that sometimes we see this reflected in the news where people are fighting and arguing, they're picketing, doing different things because they can't come to, to some kind of agreement on different problems in society. But even beyond that, what can happen is, is that you know, we'll just overlook people. Because they don't kind of fit, you know, their, their road does not cross through the highway of our own personal life, so they, they just become kind of over there and kind of non-existent to us in a certain way. So there's people we won't say hello to. There's people we might not talk to. Um, you know, and, and if you're at the checkout counter and somebody just preached a message on witnessing and you're like, well, I'm going to witness somebody when you get up there and then they got, you know, crazy looking hair and they've got rings all over their face and stuff and you're like, well, I'm not going to talk to them. Well, I was going to witness, but I mean, you know, this not this person. This is, this is probably one I'll pass on, right? And, and so what we do is because we do that, you know, we get so specialized in our own way of doing things. And, and, and so God's desire for us is that we don't overlook people. I would say the Bible, the, the desire of God is, is that, uh, that we treat people well. It's really important in a biblical sense. How we treat people is important. It's extremely important how we treat people. Uh, and, you know, we, there's people that I know that get so deep in this, like, you know, spiritual language of things, and they can preach these, like, you know, real out there messages that are on another spiritual level, you know, that we're just trying, you know, striving for that, you know. And, and yet, if they can't treat somebody with kindness, it's like, well, what are you even talking about? Like, you're so detached from reality you're on this like spiritual plane that none of us can reach, but you're so far away, you're not reaching anybody. You know, it's just like you're disconnected. I think we could all agree that we want with something that's genuine. We want something that's real. We want people that we can relate with. Uh, and the, it's important uh, that we consider how we treat people. Uh, the Apostle John said, uh, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Uh, and Paul says, Paul says the same thing. The Spirit uh, himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Uh, and, and I like that language. I use this verse specifically because you know, when we are a part of his family, uh, we are to treat people like he would treat them. And there's like there's some of that, that genetic code should be passed on to us and, and that we are to treat people in a certain kind of way. We are to uh, look at people in a certain kind of way. And I like even more, though, because this 
these passages are relating us as children, you know? The idea of us being children. What are they talking about us as being children? We're not children. We grew out of that phase, right? We're too big for that. We're too old for that. We too, you know, we got too many complicated things to face that we're not children. I, I, I feel like there's a value in not taking things so seriously all the time. We get so serious as adults. We get so uptight. And I love last week because the people coming in, it's just all so different. All the decor, and they did such a great job with VBS. Just an amazing job. Uh, kids just were having a blast. And, 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 I, and I just hope, <laughs> I just was hope, so somebody's going to shake somebody up, right? They're going to come here, what is this? What's going on? This doesn't look right, you know? And, and we need that sometimes because we get so serious, get so uptight about things, and we need to, we need to kind of loosen up a little bit. And, and life can't always be so serious. Um, and, you know, the idea here is, is that we want to treat people in a, in a God-centered way. Um, of all the people who are overlooked, often children are near the top of that list. You know, they're not wage earners, they're not heads of households, they're small, uh, they do not understand or communicate their needs effectively, uh, and this is the topic that we're getting into as we're talking about children. We're talking about looking for the overlooked. Children are overlooked. And we look to the passage, it's Mark chapter 10, and they'll have it up on the screen, but Mark chapter 10, verse, verse 13 through 16. Uh, and, and the story goes like this, that people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. So he's putting his hands on them. They want him, they want him to put his hand on them. So, But the disciples rebuked them. They rebuked them. And so here we have these people bringing kids to Jesus, and we have the disciples rebuking them. Verse 14, when Jesus saw this, what did he, how did he respond? He was indignant. He said to them, let the children come to me. And not only that, don't just let them come to me. Don't hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And this is like, you know, a side note, but I mean, it's really interesting that he's relating this idea of the kingdom of God being so close to children, right? There's something unique about a child and the way that a child is, is that, that, the, that the kingdom of God is very close to a child. So there's, there's, that's an important thing. We should pay attention to that. So like, you know, we think of the kingdom of God, we're talking about salvation. We're talking about salvific issues. And so, you know, here, here, here he's relating children to that idea. And, and to truly, I say to you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And there's a lot you could go to there, right? There's a lot you could talk about with children, and, and, and we're, we're not going to get into some of those, those complicated issues right now, but the, there's, there's much there in that passage. And he, and he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Uh, some, you know, some... Everyone treats children slightly different, but what we see here in the passage is that children are of value to Jesus. Children are important to Jesus. And it, when, we, when we look at this passage, we see that uh, he, he was indignant. What, what that's saying is, is that he got angry. So we don't see Jesus getting angry about everything in the scripture. He got angry about some things, but in this situation, he's getting angry. And it's actually kind of like a righteous anger that, that, that somebody has been wronged. So you're doing something... Uh, and, and somebody accuses you uh, of doing something wrong that you didn't do, and it's something bad, it's going to make people think bad of you, you're upset, you want to defend yourself, you're angry, you're indignant. You say, no, that's not right, that didn't happen, you know, and this is Jesus. He's, he's stepping in, he's saying something wasn't right, something was done here that wasn't right, and I'm going to make it right, I'm upset, and I'm going to straighten this out. He's going to clear this out. He's indignant, he's angry. This is the only reference to Jesus being indignant in the scripture. So this is a pretty powerful thing here. He's stepping out, and this, these children are important to him. 
They brought the parents, bring their children to Jesus. Now, what's happening here? Uh, you know, Jesus is, Jesus is there. They call him rabbi. You know, the people would call him rabbi. They're calling him teacher. And they, there is the idea that people would bring their children to a rabbi to have them bless their children. So they're bringing the children to Jesus. Now, the other thought here is that these children, they're small enough where the parents have to bring them. So these are not like big, big kids, right? These are children that the parents are bringing the children to, the, to Jesus, so they're smaller, and they want him to bless the children like a rabbi would bless them. How about these parents? Who do you just give your kids to, right? Who do you just give your kids to? You don't just take your kids to anybody, right? There's a faith, there's a trust, and these parents are bringing their children to Jesus to give these children to Jesus. Say, bless my child. There's faith there and trust that he can do something for them that they're not going to get somewhere else. And so these parents are bringing them to the teacher to be blessed. Our children, they need to be led to Jesus. Our children need to be led to Jesus. So I know we got parents in here. We got grandparents in here. We got a variety of unique situations where people have children in their homes. And I'll say this you have one shot to raise your kids and to lead them to Christ before they move out of your home. Now, I mean, we hope that they move out when they're 20 or somewhere around that age, right? Some people, they're, you know, if they're in the basement and they're 30, you got some problems, right? Something went wrong somewhere. Um, but you've got a shot at this, and you've got to think about it in this way that you're leading them to Christ. They're not just in your home so you can just give them food. And I was just talking with somebody about this the other day, and I'm just, I take this personal because I think it's so important because I see it over and over again. All right, I, I was, okay, so, I'm, okay, so I'm, I was a youth pastor in, 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 for seven years, so it was long enough to see uh, a lot of things just kind of happen and unfold, and one of the things that I saw, and if I've said this before, I'm just going to repeat it here, but, but one of the things that I noticed was that as these kids were going into youth, and, and they get kind of in the teen years, these parents would, these parents would try to reach out to their kids, and their kids are like, I don't want anything from you. Well, what happened? Well, I was there long enough to see what happened, is those parents never engaged their kids... They didn't have any meaningful conversations with their kids. And then what happens is they get into their teens and it flips. The script flips. And so because you raised your kid and you never wanted to have anything to do with them, you just try, well, I provided for them. I gave them food. I did all these things for them. But you never had any kind of engagement with them. You never had you know, some meaningful conversation. What are, you know, do you know what their favorite color is or anything? Just something, right? And these parents, it was, they were too busy for that. The kid, they're little. I can't relate to this kid. And then they get in the teen years, a little bit older, we can talk about some mature things now, but the kids don't have anything to do with them. The whole script just flipped. And, and so it's important that we treat kids with respect and the same consideration and concern that we would do anybody else. Now, they don't understand like we do, but everybody in here has a different level of understanding, right? And, and so what we have, when we talk to children, we want to relate with them. We want to have some, we can have meaningful conversations with them, but you know, as parents and as grandparents, you, know, you, you have a shot at this and you want to lead them. They're not just in your home to feed them and kind of get barely get by or just whatever, just to make sure they're not dead. You know, my job is to make sure they don't die, you know. And, and, but, but you're leading them to Christ. And if you can't witness to anybody else, witness to your kids. If you can't lead someone else to Christ, lead your kids to Christ at least. And who else has a better advantage than you do? And there's no better time to start than now. And so we want to lead our kids to Christ. We want to have that faith to say, I'm going to keep bringing my kid to Christ because there's something that they're going to get from him that they're not going to get from anywhere else. And that's what we see with these parents here, bringing their kids to be blessed by Jesus. But, you know, the disciples, the disciples, they, they are like, they're getting, they're getting real intense here, and they're pulling them back, right? They're pulling the children back. The disciples are pulling the people back. Well, it's kind of funny, right? Because these are the people that are around Jesus. You think they'd know his heartbeat. 
if the children are so important that Jesus, one of the disciples, are right here in the middle of all this, and they're pulling the people back, don't be bringing your kids here. This is serious church business. It was like the point last week, right? We have VBS. And I love that we did that. I love that we highlight kids. I love that there's something that we can emphasize children because they're important. And what the principle we see here is, uh, is that even the experienced, I'm fifth generation Pentecostal, you know. My line comes all the way down from Paul, you know. Yeah. I was there on Azusa Street. Um, so so we get, we're so professional, right? The disciples are professionals, and, and we as professional churchgoers that we can get so wrapped up in the seriousness of everything and the professional and all this stuff that, that we'll, we'll overlook people. Disciples overlook people. You and I will overlook people. And it takes Christ sometimes to correct us. It takes the Word of God sometimes to correct us to get our minds a little bit right, to adjust us. And you could imagine, that's probably a pretty embarrassing thing. The disciples are walking around with Jesus, and, and here he corrects them. It says he rebuked them. This was no light thing. That's embarrassing. You know, but I'm, but I'm professional. I've been hanging out with them all the time. You know, I'm with them, you know. That's, you know. And, and he rebukes them. So what that shows us is that you and I can easily do the same thing. And, and so we want to bring ourselves to that place where we see people in the way that Christ sees them. We don't want to overlook people. And what I think here is happening is, is that there's something, you know, you know what, what is it that it's, it's people, it's people that we don't understand. There's a variability with children. And I think that, you know, when we see people who don't look like us, when we don't, we can't predict what they're going to do, there's uncertainty there. We feel a little uncomfortable. Now, I'm not saying to suggest today that we need to go out, you know, you need to go to Skid Row and really test yourself at the limits or something, you know? Like, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm just talking about, let's just go a step in one direction here where, where we can see the people around us, and, and sometimes people, they are very weird, and there is a problem there. I get that. But sometimes people are weird, and there's not a problem there. They're just weird. You know, we're all weird. <laughs> Right? Um, we get so specialized that we, we, we can't stop and, and, and just relate. Um, kids will do, kids do things that, <laughs> they do things that you don't predict. So my kids, I have three boys, and they, they have a triple bunk, and they, so I said to them, I want you to make your bed. And this is pretty simple instruction. And I always think my instructions are pretty simple. I mean, I've done enough teaching in my life. I thought, you know, I, I should be able to communicate in a way that my kids will understand fully the full, you know, essence of what I'm trying to get across. So I said, I want you to make your bed in the morning. Now, I don't want to get into why that matters to me, but it just does, you know. So I just said, I want you to make your bed. And so I go in there, and I, they're going to bed. And then all right, this next morning, I get up, and they're like, oh, the bed's made, but... They slept on top of the bed with a blanket. So they said, and in their mind, they're like, okay, I want to make my bed. I'm just not going to sleep in the bed at all. I'm just going to sleep on top, and I'll make sure the couch, you know. That's not what I was trying to get across to them. And I wouldn't even have thought to, like, explain it in that specific detail, right? Like, they're just, but they're going to do, this is what I'm talking about. They're going to do something that's totally different than what you would have done, right? And... And these are the kind of things that uh, separate us from other people, is when people are different than us. They think differently than us. Their expectations are different. Uh, my son, we were at Trader Joe's, and he, he was littler at the time, and we're on this aisle. And at Trader Joe's, they have these, it's a grocery store, they have these, these carts for kids, you know, and they're like maybe this big, you know. They're still good size, you know, they can put a good amount of groceries in there. And so I said to my son, I don't know, maybe he's four or five at the time, and we're in the aisle together, you know. I'm over here getting some stuff, and, and I got one son next to me, and then I said to him, I said, can you go over there and give me some bananas? Well, we normally buy bananas. You just grab a, you know, just like a thing of them, four or five, you know. Okay, and I, so I turn my head for a moment, and I'm, I'm looking at what I'm getting here on the shelf. And so a couple minutes later, he comes over, and he has the cart full, overflowing with bananas. He took all the bananas off of the rack and put them into the cart. He's like, Dad, I got the bananas. 
I don't, okay, so why did he do all that? You know, I'm like, why, why would he think that we would want that many bananas? Their expectations are different, right? Like in his mind, he wants some bananas. We're going to have bananas all day. You know, he loves bananas. And so, you know, they're, they're, they're going to make things uncomfortable. And I've, so I've shared the story maybe before. I'll share it again. Some of you maybe heard this, but, you know, we, we had spent, we were in uh, Grand Canyon, and we, were, we had spent the whole day and, and you know, just kind of walking around Grand Canyon, and, and then we were staying in Flagstaff. So we go down to Flagstaff, we get back to the hotel, we're going to go to Olive Garden and eat. And so it's a little busy, a lot of people in there, you know, and, and we're ready to eat because we're just out all day. And so they seat us, and they seat us in the middle of the room. There's like a you know, good-sized room, there's a table right there in the middle of the room. They sit us at the table. And in this Olive Garden, they have these chairs with rolly wheels in the bottom. These are great for kids, you know, because they can just move the chair around. And so we're sitting there, and we get our order in. We're waiting. And, you know, it's busy, so you're waiting a little bit of time. And so my son, my little one at the time, you know, he may, maybe was he like five or something, four or five at the time, and, and he's kind of flopping around in his chair. And I said, so I said hey, you know, because my thought is you're just going to sit on your bottom and keep your legs down. So that's what I'm going to tell him. Sit on your bottom, put your legs down. And I said, pull up to the chair, to, to the table. You know, pull up to the table. Because so, I don't even know what could go wrong with him doing that, but I just have that instinct that something could go wrong. I don't know, but I know enough to know that there could be a problem, right? So, and he's just, he's uncomfortable, I guess. I don't know, he's, I mean, we were out all day, they'd be tired, he just want to sit, but he doesn't want to sit, he's just f***ing around. And, and so, so they finally bring our food out, and you know, they bring the food out, and they get these giant, like, trays. You know, the big tray, they get all the dishes on them, and, you know, however they carry all those dishes on a big tray. They do, and then they put it on that, like, there's like a little fold-out thing that they put them on. And, and so they're putting our, and we're all excited because we got our food. It's been a long time. We're hungry. And they get all the, they're out there. There's one dish left. And it's just like, you know, some kind of Alfredo or something, white sauce dish, and it's on the other side. And so at this perfect moment, my, my son's flopping around, and it was just at that perfect moment that the flopping around was enough to make the, ta- the chair flip. And when the chair flipped, the top of the chair hit that tray, and because it was on the other side, it took make up a perfect catapult. And so, so that dish went up into the air. So, and there's, there's moments in life when something like this happens, and it's slow-mo. I don't know how that works, but you're just going to see it all kind of happening and unfolding, and you're thinking all these thoughts. I don't know how that works in our minds. And I'm just watching this dish go up in the air, and, the, the, and all the pasta's coming out, and the sauce is in the air, and it lands right on the lap of the lady sitting right there in the booth. And I just was just stunned, you know. I'm like, okay, I was hungry, and, and that was my dish. That was my dish. <laughs> I, <laughs> so they brought me another one. They took, they took care of her. Um, it was embarrassing. Uh, it was really embarrassing. Um, so, so now I know. I wasn't sure what could happen, but now that I knew for sure, now what was, gonna, what was possible. We... Uh, so, so he's um, he's sitting there now, and you know he, now he does not, he's not moving around anymore. Now he's sitting on his bottom. Now he's going to listen now. Uh, but what happened there? So it's unpredictable, right? Kids are unpredictable. They're going to do something, and, and you could argue if it's the best timing or if it's the worst timing. <laughs> you know, they're going to do something totally unpredictable. You know, so so they see things differently than you different expectations than you do. They're, gonna, they're, they're unpredictable. They're going to do something at a time you're not expecting it. And that can make you feel uncomfortable. And, and you know, so I, I think, and I don't know if this coming across the wrong way, but I almost like to see people get a little uncomfortable sometimes because, you know, it's, it's great, you know, that person who's really uptight, just put a kid in the room with them and see them, like, just squirm. You know, they're really just... And I thought, oh, that's great. That is a perfect scene right there. Because I think we, we need to kind of get out of that a little bit. Right? And, and you, you, you know, probably a lot of us, most of us, maybe, maybe all of us, maybe not all of us, but you know, yeah, you're, you're married. Uh, and and when, you, when you get married, it's like there's that adjustment. You know what I'm talking about? You're like, you're, 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 this is like different. And, and so... Okay, so the, I'm getting to the kids next. So it's like there's an adjustment when you get married. But then, then there's like the kid stage. So it's like another level of adjustment. 
And when, what I learned is like, okay, I'm going to become a parent. And, I, and to, to, you know, I've been doing it for a little bit now. I, I realized that if I'm going to try to make everything perfect, I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> if I go into things with this mindset, like everything is going to stay just like it is, something's going to break. Like literally, like things are going to be breaking in the room. Like this, something's going to... Uh, and, and so, you know, I realized that I had to change my mindset and realize that things are going to be a little different. So, okay, nobody likes to live in an uncertain, you know, uncertainty, but you, in a way, you're going to have to be okay with that if we want to experience good things in life. So a little bit of uncertainty is going to be okay. And so I, I go into it now, and I'm, I've learned over the years of time that I have to like, kind of adjust every once in a while to this, and I have to say, okay, um, they're not going to do it just the way I want them to do it. This isn't going to unfold the way I want it to. I'm going to go to Olive Garden. It's very possible something's going to get knocked over. Uh, I have one child who just seems to be very good at knocking glasses over. I just don't understand. It's like the same one every time, you know, and, and it's just, so, but, so if I'm just freaking out, all right, grandparents and parents and everyone else who, who could possibly be raising kids, uh, if I'm allowing myself to go that way, uh, I'm a little too, I'm wound a little too tight, okay? Now, sometimes kids, they need to be yelled at. I'm just, right? Sometimes kids need to be yelled at. I, I, I. My kids need to be yelled at. Maybe not your kids, my kids. And sometimes I'm happy when I see someone else yelling at my kid. I'm like, good, they need that, right? Like, you know what I'm talking about? You're like the coach, you're like, you get them involved in a sport, you're like, okay, good. Okay. Then there's levels of yelling that doesn't need to happen, right? There's level of intensity that we don't need to approach kids with, okay? And so what we need to be mindful of is we're like, the kids, are, they're different. They're going to receive things different. Um, and, and so we want, we want to understand that, uh, and we want to relate with them. And so we don't want to get so stuck in our way of doing things in the world, and, that, and our world is so much just perfect uh, in the way we do things that when things get shaken up, we're getting upset, or we're getting grumpy, uh, or even beyond that, that we're so focused on our, our world that, that we don't look beyond that to say, hello to somebody like a child. So let me ask you this. People come in the door in the front. Everybody in here is shaking their hands. Oh, this is a new person. I'm doing a good job of shaking somebody's hand that came in the door. They have two kids behind them. Shake their hand, shake the hand, the mom, the dad, and then no one shakes the kids' hands or nobody high-fives them or no one says hello to the kids, you know? Well, we don't think about that, but they are people like other people, right? Like, they're, they're people. They're little people. And to us, we're giants. So, so to some of us, Andrew's a giant, so can imagine children looking at Andrew. Yeah, like he's a real big giant to them, right? Yeah, like, but there, there were giants to them. Do you ever think about that? I mean, they're like, they're, they're little, right? And, and so we have, when we approach a child, like it's a big deal. And everything needs to be appropriate, right? Everything needs to be appropriate. Everything needs to be appropriate with kids. Uh, but to uh, acknowledge a child, to say hello to a child, right? You say, like, well, this is no big deal. They're just talking about kids, how I treat kids. It is extremely important how we treat kids. There are a lot of problems and whacked out stuff that goes on in the world today because people abused kids. And if we could then put some of the goodness into this world and the way we approach kids to offset some of the horrible things, right? I mean, I, I mean I'm looking at statistics, and it's, it's, it's sickening. They talk about females, that like a fourth of females have been abused in a sexual way. It's disgusting. It's horrible. You know, like talk about people, multiple people make comments about there's this particular mall around here that, that a lot of kids get abducted from. You know, it's just, and, and, and these are horrible things. Now, my job is not today, like, go, let me get you all emotional, talk about all the horrible things in the world. We all know those things happen. Uh, but man, if I could bring some good into this world and, 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 and if I could impact a child in a positive way, if I could just say hello. So I was going to coach sports, and this is my kid's team, and I was, re I was trying to read because I was thinking, okay, I know how to do this, but I'm going to read. And they were talking about how kids won't remember the games, but they'll remember their coach. And that's because that coach had such an impact on their life. And, and so as adults, right, we can have an interaction with a child that can, can make a difference for the rest of their lives. And so the disciples, they didn't get this. Disciples, they're like, no, you know, come over here. 
get these kids out of here. This is serious business. And we don't want to get so serious within the church that we overlook people that are important. We were having a conversation the other day. Some people that were talking about people reserving their seats. People get real particular about their seats. And I'm about to go there. Get comfortable. You know, I don't get too comfortable. <laughs> I don't care where I sit. As long as I can sit with my family. I'm just going to make this point. I'll sit in the sound booth. I'll sit in the back row, front row. I'll stand behind the baptismal. I don't really care if I'm capable, right? As long as I'm with my family and he, you know, wherever he's okay with me sitting, I'll sit there. But like I, want, I don't want to prohibit anybody from coming in here and sitting in this, in this service, right? right? So what I'm talking about is just getting so comfortable with the way I do things that I overlook people. And it's the way I am I considerate of the people around me. We're talking specifically about children. Um, and, and so children are not unimportant. Children are very important. They are our future. And, and even in the first five years, so much is set in a child's life that, that you want good things to be planted there so that good things come out. We had a quizzing tournament yesterday. Uh, my kids, they didn't win first place, but they memorized over 200 verses. Okay, so I'm, where, my focus is, is I want to plant good, yeah, I want good things. That's just one mechanism. But what I'm saying is, is that your interaction with kids, if this is an environment, you know, and we want to always have transparency and safety for kids. So I used to have this mindset that I, I didn't really care about other people's kids. Okay? And, and, and Jimmy Alexander can relate with this. He, you know, people would be like, hey, here, you want to hold my baby? And I'd be like, I don't want to hold your baby. You hold your own baby. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I just didn't want to hold the baby, all right? I was <laughs> okay. But I had kids, and I thought, well, I love my kids. I, I wanted to be a dad. I, wanted, you know, I had the vision of being a father. And I, you know, when I had my kids, I'm like, man, I'm going to be the best. That's like my goal. I'm going to be the best dad ever, you know? And, and I still want to do that. That's like one of the things in my life. I want to be like the best parent I can possibly be, right? But it was just, you know, I'm like, oh, my kids, I'm like focused on my kids. And then somebody, I was at a, I'm ministering at a church, and they were like, we want you to be the children's pastor at our church. And I think that's just kind of how that happens. You just get asked to do that, right? And I don't, is that how that works? Um, he's not looking. He's not looking. <laughs> I, I, it's funny because I, we have several groups of friends and they're, and they're all children's pastors. <laughs> like, I mean, all these children's pastor friends. Uh, and everybody was asked to do it. You know, it's just how that works. But when I did that, I was like, oh, I don't know. This is so new to me. And we went in there. We did a lot of good. We started a quiz program there. We, we, we organized things. It was really good. It went, went well. By well, the time I got done, I was like, man, I love those kids. It changed my thinking on it and how I relate with the kids. Like, it really expanded my thinking. I was like, man... These kids are coming in here, and it was like, man, you recognize the importance of safety and accountability and making sure our kids are safe and protected, right? We recognize these things. We recognize, like, these kids, man, they got hard. They're like, man, it's, these kids were awesome. And when we left there, I had a hard time. I was just like, man, I was going to get emotional. I was like, man, my goodness. So now I see kids, I'm like, I look at it differently a little bit. I was like, hey, let's high five. I'm going to talk to a kid. I'm going to say hello. Now, we don't have to say, like, you guys are going to go out there and just say, go out there and talk to all the kids. So, you know. But I'm saying that we want to acknowledge people who are overlooked. And we want to be in an environment here, we want our kids to be in an environment where they feel safe and protected, where they can be feel fr- like people are friendly to them and that they're loved and it's a place of safety for them. Uh, and we are the ones to do that. Grandma's house should be a place of safety. It should be a place where I can have conversation with grandma. Uh, my home. It should be a place where my kids feel safe and protected, that they can talk with somebody, they have a person that will listen to them. And, uh, and so, <clears throat> and, and so th- I mean, this is, this is scriptural. Uh, and, we, and we see it uh, over and over in the scripture. And what we recognize here is, is God's desire that we treat people with kindness, but that we don't overlook people. Uh, and, and so it's a perspective change uh, and how he treats people, how we treat people. But let's not get so focused on the way we are doing things that we overlook people, that we overlook the people that look different than us. So what can I do here? Well, in relation to the children, you know, maybe for you it's being involved in the children's ministry in some kind of way. 
some, you know, maybe it's not much, maybe it's a little bit. Maybe it's just saying hello to children when they come in the doors now instead of just ignoring them, right? Uh, maybe there's kids in your family that, that need somebody that can love them and, and just talk to them and relate with them in some kind of way. Maybe when they are 14 and 15 and 16, because you did that, they all listen to you and talk to you and you can lead them to Christ or something. Uh, VBS next year, we just the VBS. I mean, maybe it's, that's something that you're involved in because you think, well, maybe kids are important. Maybe I can help out there. Um, we, we don't want to be so out of touch where we've lived life so long doing things the way we do it that we don't relate with them. Um, you know, God loves everyone. Uh, his, he, he sacrificed for our sins. Uh, John says this, he says, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Uh, we, we have a responsibility to relate with everyone. Uh, his, his redeeming power is for everyone. Uh, parents, let's lead our kids to Christ. Grandparents, let's influence our, our grandchildren and, and the kids we're raising. Um, church body, let's, let's, let's have a loving and caring environment for our kids where kids are important in this church, that we show that value through our actions and, and how we talk to the kids and, and treat them. Uh, and, and, I, and I'll conclude with this. You know, uh, I, I passage of Isaiah 61 um, the spirit, of the, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness uh, for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord, uh, Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. And verse 3, and provide for those who grieve, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Man, if I can just do the work of the Lord. Can we have a heart for people? Can we have a heart for the children of our church and the children of the people who bring them in here? Man, we want to win families. We want to win families to this church. We're an inviting environment for our kids. And, and man, we got to love people. we got to have that heart that we want to see that messed up stuff that they've gone through. We want to be able to replace that with something bigger and greater. And there's power in, the, in Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you this. So I, I look at my life and all that I've been through, and I think to myself, like, you know, here I'm up here. Well, I, I look at all that I grew up around, all those Sunday school teachers, so when I got in my teens and things were getting kind of weird at home and things kind of got messed up, I still kept going to church. Well, it was a hundred Sunday school lessons. Hundreds of sermons that I heard. Sitting on the pew. All those things added up. It was Sister Watermilk and Kent Curry and the Romans. Todd Gaddy. People that would teach me and that would be there for me. And they would teach me lessons. And they cared. And the Romic on his guitar playing his acoustic guitar in Sunday school, you know? All those lessons build up. And you're going to see kids. They're going to come up and be ministers, missionaries, leaders, church, people who witness and reach out to people. We, you and I, have that impact on a child's life. In Jesus' name. God bless you all. Thank you so much.